I'm Chad Rethermans. And I'm Andy Kinnick. And welcome to No Clip Pocket. How low can you go? Today, we're going to be talking about Limbo, a game that was developed and published by Playdead, uh, was eventually published by Microsoft, uh, and it was released in 2010 on the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3. And then in 2011 on Windows and OS X, 2013 on Vita and iOS, 2014 on Linux, Xbox One, 2015 on Android and PS4, and then lastly in 2018 on the Nintendo Switch. Uh, Yep, once again, game with lots of releases. A big fat pile of releases, Mm -hmm. like always. Uh, But first, if you give us a like or a rating, it'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, So Limbo is a... It's a platformer. It is a 2D platformer, and it is at least debatably within the genre of cinematic platformer uh, in the vein of games like Another World or Odd World or other games with world in the title, <laughs> which I yeah. didn't realize before I started saying that. Yeah, you could also call it a puzzle platformer. Yeah. I think that the puzzles... Uh, I'm already second-guessing myself with that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think I, w- I would call it a cinematic pe- platformer personally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll we'll talk more about the actual puzzles here in a bit. But um, the the gist of the game is a sort of go left to right platformer style. Um, but while the game itself designates levels in the form of the chapter select, yeah, in game you never really see anything. It's just like a single continuous. Uh, journey from one side to the other Um, and the game's reputation at the very least is that it is a very difficult game that focuses on more of a trial and error style of play yeah i was i was thinking of it as like gotcha design a bit yeah i think it plays into i mentioned this on the the description of the last pocket episode but not in with my vocal cords and Uh shit in the written word yes uh (laughs) my preferred medium Uh please it's why you host a podcast exactly (laughs) um but this game is not a horror game uh, sorta it's It's more kind of spooky i guess yeah it's like an unsettling game uh and i creepy (laughs) that gotcha design plays a big part of that Mm -hmm. the fact that you can kind of just be casually strolling along and then just get snapped up in a bear trap and explode into blood uh-huh. uh, is just a thing that can happen on occasion. Uh, and it's a little bit scary, but I think that the end result of it more often than not is that you're just never casually strolling anywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second you get got, you're like, I'm fuck you, game. I'm never falling for that one again. And you fall for the same one multiple times. Yeah, so. it. It's definitely one of those games that feels like you have an adversarial relationship with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, you, you get got uh, initially, and then you, you have this attitude of, like, now when you're playing, it's like, I am trying to beat the game in, a, in that sense where, like, I'm not going to fall for its tricks. Right. You still will. But, you know, like, because you start out and you just, you die to all of them, you know, and then as it progresses, you kind of get wise to at least some of the the things that it pulls. Yeah. And you don't charge in. You know? <laughs> this is like a, a very, this is a game that came out in 2010. But, and I'm going to make a, co- a comparison to a game that came out in 2018. Uh-huh. So the game obviously predates this kind of thing. But it gives me the same feeling as... Uh, the existence of of troll levels in Mario Maker, Mm -hmm. which exist purely to, the good ones anyway, kill you in interesting ways that you wouldn't expect. Where each time that you go, every time that you bypass an obvious death trap, it feels like an accomplishment. Uh, And I think that that holds very true in this game. Like, when you suss out something and jump over it or do a thing that you wouldn't normally do because the game caught your attention with it, uh, it feels like a big big success for the player. Uh, And I think a success for the design as well, because I think it's trying to get you to look for that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it manages to thread the needle and not feel frustrating. 
Um, I will call out two exactly two examples, uh-huh. uh, but we we can get to them later. I mean, where the, I felt like it did. Yeah, the, the fact that you only have two, it, it being very unpatient. Yes. Uh, is I think a testament to the fact that it is well done. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. Uh, I kind of like. I have I have an adversarial relationship with myself over my own adversarial relationship to the game. Uh-huh. Uh in a sense because well I don't I genuinely don't think that this game is difficult from a platforming standpoint. No. Um there may be a couple of tough jumps in the whole game but for the most part it's more about figuring out where you need to be yeah than actually accomplishing it. Um <laughs> but I found myself in this situation where I felt like the very beginning of this game is extremely good. Uh, and then the end of this game, debatably the whole second half of this game, mm-hmm. is kind of weak because it leans really far into the platforming and the puzzle solving in more or less abstract environments. Yeah, it definitely shifts focus as it goes. Um, I, I, it feels like, like once again, like we were saying, um, they kind of expect the player to be adapting to their tricks. So, like, once they feel like it's run its course, they kind of stop doing that as much, and it's more about the puzzles and, like, like timing puzzles and things like that. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know how I feel about it necessarily. I don't want to... It's not that I don't want to be a hypocrite. It's also not that I do want to be a hypocrite. I'm making the argument that this is not hypocritical of me. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> you will be judged. I will be. Uh, <laughs> but I remember saying on several other episodes, the ones that spring to mind to me are uh, Monument Valley and Donut County, mm. that were games that felt like they had a very neat central mechanic set and did not go far enough with them. And I would like to now change that argument to I think that Limbo goes too far Mm. with its mechanic set and becomes too complicated. And the elements of the game that are unique and cool, because run and jump are not unique, (laughs) they're kind of cool, but it's not like new, become a lot less impactful when you're replaying the same segment over and over again or Mm. when the segment you're doing is jump on the H like (laughs) it's just not that like I mean I called the H out the hotel sign is a cool set piece but you know what I mean Mm -hmm. um yeah I think to me it feels like a little bit more of a natural progression um that I did not mind but I don't disagree I think the first half is more memorable and probably more enjoyable to play through but yeah I don't know I think the game's length kind of makes it work for me where I don't really mind uh, that it kind of changes into something else and then ends. Yeah, sure. Uh, I I don't mean to bring it up to, like, damn the game. Uh I just think that it is uh, probably its weakest element, in my opinion. We're we're going to get into some stuff uh, that this game does that I think are that that it does incredibly well and probably gave Playdead a lot of its reputation. Um, But, yeah, the part where it becomes a platformer, like an actual puzzle platformer with more of a focus on the actual mechanics of it, Mm -hmm. is where I start going, like, I don't feel like I'm playing Limbo anymore. Yeah, nothing's chasing you and trying to kill you anymore. (laughs) Right. Now you got to push this mine cart and jump off of it. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, let's let's talk about my first frustration point, I guess, uh-huh. uh, and we can lead sort of into puzzles and stuff if we want after that. Um, this isn't really a puzzle, um, but it's part of a larger set piece thing. Uh, there's a sequence in the game with a, with a big spider. Uh, I love the big spider. Mm-hmm. It's I I can't say that I love the design because it is very spider. Uh huh. Uh, <laughs> and there isn't much different about it than a regular spider, uh, except it's... It's a silhouette. Yeah, it's a little bigger also. Uh, <laughs> but you do a neat part where the spider is just sort of hanging out, hunting, doing its spider thing, and you, like, snap its legs off and shit. 
Uh, and all of it in the end culminates with you like fucking tearing its legs off in an extremely brutal and yet very satisfying like victory mm-hmm. moment for for child. Yeah, I I thought you were just gonna have to drag it by the leg in into a pit and use and jump over on it, but you just rip its leg off. Yeah, it's it's fucking nasty. Yeah, it's pretty brutal. Mm-hmm. But there's a part in the middle there where the spider catches you. Uh, by the way, this game. If you have arachnophobia, don't do not <laughs> recommend. Um, but it it fucking wraps you up in a web, and then it changes your move set a little bit so that when you walk, hop you hop. Along. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the hop along frog segment, as we call it in the business. Uh huh. It's a classic <laughs> segment. And uh, my my point of frustration is just rolling that ball. I feel like is unreasonably punishing with the fucking hop controls. What did you think about rolling that ball? <laughs> uh, I don't even really remember it, so I must have not had any trouble with it at all. It does seem what, like the what case. What about it is punishing? Uh, it's not. It's pretty easy to roll the ball, uh-huh. but you have to dismount the ball pretty quick or else the spider will impale you. Uh. Uh, and if you hop and don't jump mm-hmm. at the at the last thing then you will be too slow and the spider will stab you. Mm. And then you have to roll the ball again. And it takes a long, long time to do it. Uh, This was my first frustration point. Sure. But I mostly wanted to bring it up so that we could talk about the whole spider set piece thing. So, uh, but evidently you did not, you did not find ball rolling that, uh, (laughs) that frustrating. No, I didn't. Uh, that, I feel like that was, like, such a brief, uh, moment, uh, that I thought it was weird that you called that one out. That was, like, a third of the game for me. Well, just the part where you're wrapped up. No, when I'm, when I was rolling that ball, it took oh, me, like, an hour and a you, half. Yeah, okay. No, I think, <laughs> I have no idea how many tries it took. It, in total, it was probably less than five minutes, but, you know, you know me. Yeah, I do. hmm I thought you were just going to point out that moving slowly while wrapped up in the spider webs was frustrating to you. Uh, but yeah, the spider is cool. Um, I, I like its introduction. And then I think like the, the cherry on top is the fake one mm. that the try Cause like the, the spider as the antagonist gets swapped out for like the weird tribe of humans. Yes. Um, and they have like a fake mechanical spider legs that they used, I guess, assumingly to scare people away. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I thought that was a really cool way to like end the whole spider segment of the game, and it's it's part of a very like conscientious conscientious use of uh, like environment design because not only is that a cool visual and like it reads instantly like the second you see. The spider, you go through the mental process of like, uh, big spider again, and then you you're like, uh, it's a little different, and then you so- you piece it and together. You see the guy, with yeah, the controls, and then it lets you go up and fuck with the controls mm-hmm. and move the spider legs. So you have like this tactile element to it as well, um, and that persists. Uh, it's less like overt, but you, pretty much any object in the environment you can interact with in some way or another. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all very crunchy and, and real, and I, I really like that about sort of how they set this up. Mm-hmm. Well, I like the physics-based puzzly bits. Yes. Yes, I, I do. <laughs> I do love those. Uh, what is your second frustration point? <laughs> oh, um, well, there was kind of two. The, the second one, chronologically, was me being very dumb. Uh, there's a part... Classic. Yeah. <laughs> there's a part where you have to push... You, you like... This is another ball rolling segment, weirdly. Mm. But you, like, pull a lever and a ball, put it, maybe a barrel, rolls out from a thing and you have to push it on these two carts. Mm. And oh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I kept trying to jump... Isn't it a tire? Oh, oh it is a tire. You're yeah. correct. Uh, but the, I get the tire on the first one fine, but I kept trying to jump over the first one yeah, to go pull that, the second yeah. one. <laughs> you just push it, and then you just pull the 
the first one. You yeah. don't push the first one. Uh, and I tried it probably like 15 times, like not joking. That before I, you adjusted be- your approach. Before I was like, why am I an idiot? <laughs> it's like the thing I had the most trouble with in the whole game. That's funny. And it's just so simple. Like, you just pull instead of push. Earlier today, I did try and go out a door with a big arrow on it. Yeah. So maybe this is just strictly (laughs) not my strong suit. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I had a similar experience, but on a much smaller scale, where I did it maybe, like, five times before I realized, oh, yeah, I can also, like, uh, push the first one or, pull, you know, do the opposite of what I was doing. Yeah. And make it work. Yeah, no, that even that small amount makes me feel better yeah. about the amount of time that I took figuring that yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, like, that's the challenge of the puzzle is, like, realizing what order to do things. So yeah. You can rest a little easier <laughs> knowing that that's, it was supposed to be challenging in that way. Yeah, knowing that I'm not a complete buffoon, just mostly one. Mm-hmm. Um... But yeah, and that's and that's sort of the the puzzle design uh a lot of the time and especially later in the game it gets more complicated. Yeah, I wanted to make a comparison to um I, I think I brought this up on the last Guardian episode. Um to the way Team Eco does puzzles. Um cuz I brought up like <laughs> I feel like they do puzzle design in a way that makes me feel dumb. Uh where it requires like actual outside of the box or lateral thinking. Mm-hmm. Um it, this game has some of that. Like, there was some stuff early on where I'm like, what the fuck do I do? There's, like, nothing to interact with because I'm used to playing video games and I'm looking around in the immediate environment for stuff. Yeah. And there are times where you have to, like, go back a screen or two for something uh, to climb up a rope or to push a box to where you need it to be. Um, and, yeah, I, I think that stuff... I'm always on the fence about that kind of stuff, because, like, when it takes you too long to figure it out, you get mad. Yeah. Uh, And if you figure it out, you feel like the smartest guy (laughs) of all time. So. Yeah. I think um, it's outside the box thinking, but for me, it depends on what box. Uh, sure. The <laughs> is it a box that you get to push? Push or a box that yeah. magnet? Yeah. So my the box that I like is when you have to do something where you are using the game systems in a way that they haven't previously been used before. Uh, one of the standout puzzles, and this is like a brief, like one second puzzle. I just really like its implementation. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a section with two giant boxes, and you have a switch that flips the gravity and a switch that turns the magnets on. Uh, but they're situated in different heights in mm. the area. So when you pull the switch, one of them hits the top sooner. So you turn the magnet on, you flip the gravity switch until the first one hits the top, then you turn it off and the second one falls back down. Um, and that's just a solution to the puzzle. You just turn it off sooner. <laughs> mm-hmm. Whereas like every time previously, the magnet was just a Boolean thing. It was either on or off. So... I really love that puzzle, and I love the puzzles that take place in a single screen. Mm-hmm. This is the box that I don't uh, like okay. when it expands outside of the zone of like a a, a zone. Yeah, yeah. the the sta- the opposite standout, the one that I didn't that I had a hard time with. I actually yeah. liked the puzzle. Yeah, a lot. I actually had a hard time with that magnet one. Yeah, I. I I, I think I solved it and didn't understand what was going on with it. <laughs> like what you did. I just think yeah. I just kind of like fucked with the switch and it ended up just working. Mm-hmm. I was like, I don't, I don't understand that. I and mean, then I yeah. moved on. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, continue. Yeah. The, the one that I, that I found very difficult, but I did like the puzzle in the end was uh, a little bit later than that, where you have to send a box up and then, you need two boxes and you have to push the first box from where you had it up while it's on the ceiling because Mm -hmm. the gravity has been reversed over to the other side. Uh, Or when it's not on the ceiling, you push it over, then you go up and then you push another, but don't worry about it. There's a lot of box related steps. I know the one that you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. It's a very cool puzzle uh, in design. I think it was very unclear to me where I was supposed to be going or what I was supposed to be doing when I got there. Mm -hmm. Uh, It basically came down to, I I narrowed it down to, I definitely need two boxes. Right. And then was just wandering. Like, (laughs) where's the other box? Uh, 
Uh, but yeah, I figured it out and I enjoyed doing it. So uh, I can't like, I, that isn't one of my frustration points, right. but it is one of the puzzles that I had the hardest time with in the whole game. Yeah, that's a good example because like, yeah, because like that's a thing. Like I always feel like I'm on the fence about these kinds of things. So like I think it's good. I wish. It, I think the thing is, is that more games should do stuff like this because what I think it's doing and why it feels so hard is because it's like punishing your preconceived notions about like how video game puzzles work, mm-hmm. um, and you actually have to like keep more stuff in mind. And I think that's cool. But yeah, like it is. It's difficult to get to kick those old habits. Um, and also, this is the puzzle that involves the weird gravity flip to get the box out of, like, the slanted uh, hill yeah. thing, uh, <laughs> which if, if you watch somebody do it who just knows how, like, the timing of how it works, it's, like, the simplest thing ever. But, man, it, can it be frustrating to try to get that box out of there? Yeah, you have to, like, push the box, a, a box, mm-hmm. all the way up the hill and then do everything else that you have to do before it hits the switch, and so uh, it. No, it's... that's not the one I'm talking about. Oh, that isn't it. No, it's like it's like a a box inside a little thing, and there's like a gravity switch, and you just have to get the box to fall out by yeah. manipulating the gravity. Okay, I do know what you mean. Like the one where you basically can't let it touch either the floor yeah. or the or the ceiling. Uh, yeah. I like that one also. I mean, it's part of the same puzzle, sort yeah. of. So I just that that is one of those things. I think the first time I played this game, like frustrated the hell out of me. Right. That is something that we should, I guess, mention that we have both played this game before. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did for the podcast, uh, which I guess isn't surprising because it's eleven. It's eleven years old. Yep. Um, but I did not remember pretty much anything outside of the visuals. Mm. I remembered some of the puzzles, but I also forgot most of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I don't know. I feel like the, the difference between the good and the bad puzzles in this game it tends to be how smooth the execution is, and at least in my experience, what the, like, repeat punishment is. Because there's some things, if you die, you go pretty far back. Mm-hmm. Uh and it's just, I don't know, it gets boring more than anything, I think. Yeah. No, it made me think of your puzzle mantra, where uh, if you, you know what you're supposed to do, and it's the, the execution is what's hard about it, then that's a bad puzzle. Yeah. TM, most, TM, TM. most of the time. Uh, th- this game has a few of those. Uh, I already called out the one about the minecart. Mm-hmm. I, I had a hard time working out the timing on that. Um, it's so simple. It's one of those things where you feel dumb once again, but you had to like push it so that it goes backwards and then you jump off of it before it starts rolling and then you'll have enough time to run across. Right. So simple, but took me a long time to arrive at that realization. Yeah. And I mean, I think we would both agree uh, that the game has a difficult tightrope to walk to some extent because the game is a platformer and also has puzzles in it. So there's like this element of, do you incorporate the platforming into the puzzles when you do, how hard should the platforming be? And when those knobs are tuned out of whack, you get a puzzle that can just be frustrating for really a small, dumb reason. Mm-hmm. Because you have a good, a well-designed puzzle, and you have a good platforming challenge, and those are two very different things in design. Yeah. Uh, and when the game starts asking you to do both, sometimes it's cool. I like the part at the very end where you had to do the gravity thing in like the room that has no floor, so it switches oh, off yeah. every once in a while, and so you have to like flip the switch back so that you fall back to the ground and you push yeah. stuff around. I thought that was very cool and involved both the platforming and the the other stuff. Um, the only like mechanic that I don't like in this game is the the brain slug. <laughs> I was also going to bring up the brain slugs as something we hadn't touched upon. Mm-hmm. Um, it it is it feels too simple because mm-hmm. uh, they just make you go in one direction 
uh, until you hit light, yes. and then it makes you, them turn around. Um, they don't really do much with it. Like, you'll just have to, like, do something ahead of time to stop yourself from walking off a ledge or something. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the most that ever really um, comes of it. But it did make me think about um, Inside, yes. Play Dead's next game uh, that they did after this. Um, and, like, just the theme of mind control being, like, present in both. Um, and, it, yeah, it just it feels underdeveloped in this one. Like, I don't really understand why like, i don't know it just feels half-baked yeah it, it feels like a good idea yeah it, it doesn't tie in thematically or I, at least i think right uh or like they don't really do anything interesting with it mechanically either no i agree i think that like I and mean, we'll talk about some of the themes uh this game is largely up to interpretation with some more globally accepted ideas mm -hmm. um but it doesn't really f the the part of it that fits tonally is that it is oppressive, uh -huh. which and that's but that's it really like, um, yes, having your agency taken away from you is oppressing, um, but you're in a puzzle platformer and you've taken yeah. the agency away well, from yeah, your player. The, the, thinking about it a little bit more, like the only thing I could think of is is, is it supposed to be like some kind of loose meta commentary on like video games like the fact that we're controlling the kid because that, like that's a thing in both this and inside. inside yeah um i guess spoilers for inside if you haven't played it um one of like the secret ending for that is you go into like an underground bunker and you pull the plug on like a mind control helmet thing and then the boy collapses as right. if he's been controlled by somebody the whole time aka you uh so I, I i find that interesting that that was also in here maybe a little bit yeah and it's all it is a lot more overt and inside especially like you even have the mind control helmet yeah that lets you control the drones yeah it's like they took this idea and did then actually fleshed it out for, yeah for inside and if you haven't played inside that's such not a big spoiler because it's the secret ending that you will well, not you won't get. get but just <laughs> yeah, I just want to let people know. That I'm gonna no, say that's it. fair. I just wanted to bring it up so that I can then also append. If you haven't played Inside, totally play it. Do play it. It's very good. Um, but yeah, the that's that's kind of my issue with the brain slug. Also, I agree with what you're saying. <laughs> I think uh, there's one part that I think is cool. Like one time they did a cool thing with the brain slug, uh -huh. uh, where you have to jump on uh, a ladder in order to keep yourself from moving while things oh, that are yeah. on a timer cycle. That's really good. It's like the final boss of the <laughs> brain slug part. <laughs> yes. I did like the little monsters that eat them off your head. Yeah, they were cute. That was a fun design. Oh, Don't they also drop a brain slug on you to uh, intercept you before you meet up with the girl? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like a trick, like an angler fish kind of thing. Right. Or the girl. You don't even notice the slug because mm -hmm. you, you notice the girl. It's super good, and that is a great use of it. But yeah. then you're forced into one of these fucking worm segments that isn't the best. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they try to do something interesting with it. It just doesn't quite, doesn't quite get there. Yeah. The very last segment with it is fine. Fine to good. <laughs> on the scale <laughs> fine too good and that one instance but otherwise i'm not a big giant fan yeah do you have any opinion on like the uh the way that the the little boy is killed graphically <laughs> <laughs> um, as in in a graphic way mm -hmm. if that wasn't clear I yeah said, not i said, I said that weird yeah there's no ray tracing on the boy <laughs> yeah i would like my money back <laughs> Uh, it just kind of stood out to me. Like some of the deaths, I'm like, oh, that little boy just got exploded. <laughs> yeah, I did have thoughts, and I did not come to many conclusions about them. Yeah, because like I was, it made me think of like uh, the Tomb Raider reboot. I was literally where, also yeah, thinking like, Lara Croft gets brutally killed, mm -hmm. but that's a much more realistic looking. So it feels like a lot more like, oh, yeah. I don't like seeing that over and over again. Tomb Raider to me feels more gratuitous. Yeah, even though this is like a capable adult woman on a mission in a dangerous location <laughs> well, with guns. Yeah, they take it over the top, though. She'll, like, fall on a fucking sharpened stick. or in, I don't know. It's gross. Yeah. It's super <laughs> gross, and she bleeds a lot and screams and struggles. 
which is not present in this game. And of course, this game, which we haven't talked about yet, uh, the visual style of this game makes it uh, obviously a lot more cartoony in the sense that you can't see anything uh, and it is literally like not designed to look like a real person. Yeah, like everything's in silhouette. Yeah. So, uh, I felt weird about it sometimes. Yeah, Um, it was only sometimes. Mostly I didn't really notice it. Yeah, the game does three things, I think, to lessen the blow and make it... We talked about this a little bit on Inside and on Inside it's a lot more visceral because it's in color. Uh, right, yeah, you look a little bit more like a, a real boy in that yeah. one. You're you're much like much more like Pinocchio at the end of the movie. Yeah, um, but in this game, one the game's title is Limbo, which I think sets you up for sort of an uh, ethereal sort of game. Yeah, like the kid's already dead. Yeah, or you would presume. Yeah, it seems like it. Mm-hmm. And then two the visual style and then three the really fast iteration time you don't like linger on it no so yeah it's like the opposite of um metroid mm. like when samus dies and the armor explodes off of her and it reminds you that she's a huge person and not a robot right uh and that you failed her yeah (laughs) and she screams you know it's a lot more... Like, the deaths are impactful in that, and in this, you're right. You don't really think about it as yeah. much. But it is. It's, like, in both this and inside, it's, like, a very... Str- like, if you pulled someone aside and just were talking to them about games, and you're like, there's this developer I really like called Play Dead, and they're like, what's Play Dead all about? And they're like, well, they make these games where you play small children and you die a lot <laughs> graphically in them. It would, they'd be like, that's a weird through line. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, that's a strange thing to have in both of your games. Yeah, I mean, it ties into those themes, like we said. Both of them have, like, an oppressive feeling. Mm-hmm. And it feels like you're trying to... You, it feels like you start in this low place and you're trying to, like, escape. Like, climb uh, up, up and to the right yes. to get out. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it's, it gives you something to overcome, I think, to motivate you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I agree with that. I think because it's kind of a lot of the things I said. Yeah, uh, but I said it better. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, all of those are good points. That's that's kind of those are my thoughts. Those are the conclusions I didn't come to <laughs> earlier. Um, I don't know if there's much more to say about it, but um, the visual style of this was like, you said it's known for being difficult, uh, but in my mind it was known for being that silhouette platformer. Okay, yes. Um, Because like this came out in 2010 initially, so it's like, in my mind it's like an ambassador of indie games. Uh, It's one of those ones that I feel like contributed to their popularity. Um, And yeah, it seems like it's a game, as you brought up at the end of the last episode, when we said we were going to be playing this, like, check your Steam library, (laughs) you might just own this, Mm -hmm. uh, because it's been on sale a million times. Um, But yeah, um, yeah, and I think it's for a good reason. The game does look really nice, and I don't think it's, like, particularly unique for having a silhouetted style. Like, I'm sure there's a game that's done something at least similar to this before, Mm -hmm. but the... um, the execution is really good. Um, it, it's it's difficult to pull off like a black and white style and have everything read if you want to have like a lot of detail and stuff. And I think they do it really well. Yeah. To to go back a little bit to the discussion on set pieces we had, both with the spider, the hotel sign, mm-hmm. um, just things like that that are like big, notable landmarks. It, they do a lot of stuff with lighting. Mm-hmm. Some particle effects. Yeah, a little bit, a couple of particle effects, little sparks shooting out mm-hmm. uh, that, that make those things pop a lot more, <clears throat> which is one, why you remember them, why they are landmarks. Uh, but also just like, this is like the silhouette style, but done with like a very high level of expertise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they do use it a lot for atmosphere. Um and yeah, like you caught out the hotel sign. That's a great. Uh, everyone knows that from this game. Yeah. Um, example of it, but yeah, there's a lot of like in like the big spider legs mm-hmm. and all that is very uh, in the treehouse that the girl is under, and it all just really stands out uh, and gives it this. It does give it this eerie, ambient afterlife kind of feel, like they want. So yeah, it is expertly done. I think. 
And um, we talked about, as a good counterexample, um, we've talked about games like uh, Downwell, mm-hmm. which is a black and white palette, and then to a lesser extent, um, Minute. Oh, oh Minute, yeah. Um, well, I think that one's easy to read mostly. Like, there is... There are times when the screen is a little muddy with pixels and, you know. Yeah, there's they chose to go with an Atari-style yeah. sprite. But, like, uh, yeah, Downwell, yeah. I think, is a better example where it can be, like, visual clutter. Mm-hmm. Even though it's black and white, it should be high contrast and easy to see. Yeah. Yeah, because they even try, they use black, white, and red. And yeah, they, they try use... to color, and it <laughs> somehow, like, makes it worse on us. Because yeah, there's just so much going on. Yeah, so it takes some good art direction, I think, to pull it off. Like, if you don't really think about it, it seems like it might be easier. Mm-hmm. Um, but grayscale can be tricky. I believe it. Yep. Uh, I do want to call out, I guess, a bit the fact that there really weren't I mean, obviously, I'm going to take the same caveat that you did, that there probably was a game that was in silhouette prior. Yeah, probably. But the unfortunate thing about being the game that's known for having the black and white silhouette art style Mm -hmm. is that every game that does it after you is going to get compared to you. And I remember playing a game... That I don't remember the name of. Did we play? Did I play this at your house? Yes. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. And it just it looks like Limbo too, mm-hmm. but it just is a different game. Yeah, I think you, I, unless you're gonna be like a a different kind of game, you're gonna get invite the comparison. But like, I think there have been games like Donkey Kong Country Returns has silhouette levels, like sure. at the Sunset. Uh, Blasphemous had that one section that was like up on the roof or the mountain or it whatever. It was so dope, and they didn't uh, use it ever silhouette. again. <laughs> yeah, so like I think it can be cool if you use it in a platformer, but like for a couple of levels. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, if you're gonna go, you're gonna do an all silhouetted 2D platformer, you're gonna get compared. Uh, yeah, but yeah, execution is is king, though I suppose you gotta do something more different with it. Yes. Um. Uh, yeah, that's probably it. Like, it's it's a really striking and distinct art style that brought the game a lot of like popularity. Yeah, but it isn't it isn't deep necessary. Like, we can't talk about like the the design so much because they're all very flat. Yeah. Um. Though I mean, they are good shapes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you have to thing. rely on that silhouette, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So it, it leads to those distinct designs. <sighs> Fucking Team Fortress Two, eat your heart out. <laughs> I don't know if that's a joke that is that even works. It's like based on a line from the TF Two developer commentary. <laughs> I, don't I, said, I don't know what you're talking right. about. It's the they one tried person to make that it... gets that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they can all the, that one guy you share a good laugh. I'll send with the you? yeah the the good job email. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, do we want to talk a little bit about, like, the themes and the story and, and all that? We should, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, like, as we mentioned, like, we were just talking about the art style. Um, one thematic thing they do with that is it, it's always feeling like you're moving from the shadows towards the light. Mm-hmm. Um, very much being, like, light at the end of the tunnel, like you're trying to escape purgatory and, and go to heaven or to the afterlife or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, I think that's very cool, and um, I think like I was looking at interpretations of this game, so that we would have something to talk about instead of being like oh, I don't know what it was about. <laughs> um, but uh, interpretation that I found that I liked uh, is the idea that the kid has died, and he you know he sits up at the beginning, um, and then the whole thing comes full circle where you land on the ground again at the end. Um, but yeah, the idea that the kid's died and is in limbo. And he's, like, kind of pursued by his own fears. Like, he has to conquer uh, these things to escape, like the spiders. And then um, the, the the tribe of people, I think the people pointed out they just look like older boys. So maybe he's, like, bullying. Yeah. Um, or, like, feeling othered, you know, and not fitting in with people. And then it moves into the factory. And that's, his, like, the loosest one where they were, like, maybe his parents worked in a factory or something. <laughs> Something with that. Uh, I mean, to be fair, factory is terrifying. Yeah, so. something like that. Um, maybe his dad has a wood chipper and he's afraid of it. <laughs> I don't know. He saw Fargo once. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then at the end, you crash through the glass and they suggested like like the, the weightlessness puzzles, like the gravity puzzles, or maybe like, you know, he was like ejected from the car, then right. a car crash. 
Um, and then they also, uh, the girl at the end, like maybe she's like burying him or maybe, uh, like crying under the tree. Cause like, that's where they spent time together or something like that. Uh, and I thought that all seemed pretty appropriate and at least that's at least going to be my head cannon. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I think that the key thing when we're talking about the game is, that it is not there. There's no dialogue in the game. Yeah, it's all it, up to interpretation. Yeah, it's gonna be super shitty writing the opening line of the description on this one again. Uh, but yeah, there's there's nothing that's that's said. Uh, you kind of have to pick it up. I agree, especially hard with the idea that the kid died. I even yeah. kind of like latching onto the idea that he died in a car crash because I like the imagery at the end of him crashing through the glass and that is as satisfying an explanation as any debatably like maybe he was somehow sucked out of like an airplane window (laughs) that i guess would have been a similar thing but it seems terrifying (laughs) it's terrifying there'd probably be a lot more plain imagery in the game if that was the case the glass on airplane windows is really thick too i don't know if your body could crash through one but... that's tr- i mean my entire understanding of this comes from that time <laughs> mythbusters shot a gun through one of the windows oh, okay. of an airplane i have not seen that one <laughs> uh but yeah i i i like the idea a lot um not of dying in a car crash but of right. the way that this game is structured and how that plays out um I think that a lot of the specific stuff, like you said, the factory business yeah, is a little loose. That's the hardest one to to pin down. Yeah, but like Big because Spider, fear of buzz was... saws. Yeah. It's pretty <laughs> universal. So that's true. That's in everybody's purgatory. The, yeah, the buzz saw. I mean, that's why it's Super Meat Boy. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, but between the title of the game being Limbo, um, and the imagery of him waking up. And then going through and then, like, repeating things when you die. Mm -hmm. And then also basically it giving context for the gameplay. Um, I think that is the most set in stone thing that we have. Mm -hmm. Uh, And everything else is more open to interpretation. But I do love it. And I would love to hear other theories about it generally mm-hmm. uh because i just like when people try to to analyze metaphor oh, yeah, no, it's, it's fun very to... fun mm-hmm. um it's a thing like they go even more all in on the ambiguous storytelling and inside yeah and, like that was a big part of the fun of that one is like for thinking about like what it all means yeah and it's a lot more concrete it's uh if if the play dead's output was david lynch's movies uh-huh. then inside is like a maholland drive where there's a lot of stuff in it and around but there's also a lot of things to latch on to that are concrete and really happening and maybe some things throw some of that older stuff into question this game limbo feels more like inland empire where you have a vague idea of what's happening and you don't know by the end anything new mm. <laughs> you know a little bit you got the themes down yeah. I, I don't i feel like the whole idea of like the kid is dead and moving through limbo is it, pretty concrete yeah sure and there's just not as many details to latch on to like inside yeah. like ancillary stuff i just think that the amount in inside is like very high yeah as yeah. compared to this which is very it's, low. it's just a lot simpler yeah uh, yeah, the only other thing I had to say on it was, I was surprised, and I know this game came out first, and et cetera, et cetera, but, like, this really felt like a proto-inside when mm-hmm. I, when, like, revisiting it. Like, I already knew they were similar, but, like, the whole, like, just, like, the, you start out in a forest and you move to an industrial area, the mind control stuff stood out to me, um... And, like, the, yeah, just the way, like, the different threats, like, there's, like, uh, in the beginning of Inside, like, the wolves are chasing you, or the police dogs, or whatever they are, yeah. are chasing you, and this, it's the spider, and it's just, like, an evolution. It's, like, there's, like, phases in it and stuff. Um, just the parallels were stronger than I remembered. Yeah. Would you say, just as, like, a last note about Inside, mm-hmm. in comparison to Limbo, since we've talked about both of them at this point... That the visuals of Limbo are more striking than that of Inside, like, in a way that is positive to the game? Um, 
No, I don't think. I I, I think they're they're both going for a very different thing. Yeah. Um, and they both suit their games appropriately. Um, yeah, and it, like we were saying, like um, Limbo, like the visuals are tied to that theme of it being like purgatory and everything's in shadow, mm. move towards light. It all like it fits. <laughs> And in inside, everything's like very gray and washed out. It has that like oppressive, like Big Brothers watching you, or uh, like 1984 kind of style thing uh, going on, it, which fits that game like it really well. Uh, so I I, I kind of hold them in like equal esteem. Yeah, I think that's fair. Like looking at screenshots, I think Limbo probably would stand out more mm-hmm. if you like haven't played them. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's kind of where I settled on it, why I brought the question up is like I think to a consumer, Limbo mm. stands out a lot more. But like I think in motion inside, there's something about it. Like if you watched a trailer. Yeah. Inside it's like and I I cannot justify talking about Inside's visuals for too long on this podcast. Mm-hmm. But it is a very interesting style in that it's a lot of like sort of flat colors and then just like lighting. Yeah, it's like desaturated. Mm-hmm. And it makes it look sort of like yeah, like poster esque. Like yeah. it's almost papery. There's a lot of um depth to it as well, which is another contrast with this where it's all very flat. Yeah. Um but yeah, it, it does it almost looks a little bit like it doesn't look like it's made of clay. But it almost looks like kind of handcrafted. Yeah. And I think that that makes it the one that when you put it in motion is really captivating. Yeah. Uh, really interesting designs in both games. I, what, Arguably, like, the thing that Played It is most known for at this point is that their games are really visually striking. Mm-hmm. And they're actually making cinematic platformers, which no one does anymore. Yeah. Yeah, Inside actually does kind of look like Another World did, but... Not because of technology issues. Uh-huh. So if you took a fucking steam iron to <laughs> another world. <laughs> you uh, ironed out all those pixels. Yeah. Uh, do we have black and white thoughts? Uh, Kira Skira thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> um, my black and white thoughts are uh i liked this i thought coming back to it it might not be as good as i remembered um especially starting out um i felt like it had a little bit more of that obtuse design right up front Mm -hmm. uh and i was like uh i already feel like i need to pull up a walkthrough this isn't a good sign (laughs) uh but i pushed through and uh the game does hold up i i I enjoyed it quite a bit um and it, it made i think it deepened my appreciation for play dead like, I was already looking forward to seeing more from them, and now I, I am very interested to see what they put out next, and um, the other guy who split off from Play Dead, like, whatever he makes. Because, mm-hmm. um, yeah, like th- I really like cinematic platformers. I think it's a very cool... Like, doing different stuff with the platforming genre, um, I think that's why I had never really played Metroidvanias, but I kind of took to those... Uh, through doing this podcast because it's like taking the kind of idea of like a 2d side scrolling game and doing something different with it um and yeah i quite like this um the the puzzle design i think i like that it challenged me uh to do more of that uh lateral thinking uh it it looks great it's got some great set pieces it's very memorable and i do think it it really did a lot to propel uh, indie games into like a regular thing or a popular thing um so yeah i do think it's like a like a maybe not a seminal game but like an important like a uh, milestone in the history of indie games um so yeah I'm, I'm glad that we returned to it and glad that it held up yeah i think uh, <laughs> what you said at the beginning there is is really uh really hits the nail on the head because this is a game that when you come back to it, you think that it isn't going to hold up because you've now experienced yeah, more it's things. it's 11 years old. And it's now. 11 years old. But it holds up basically exactly the same as when you played it before. Now, obviously, I can't say that about everybody. But to, to me, I think that the game, when you replay it, somewhere between the atmosphere and the art style and just waiting long enough to forget most of the puzzles... The game is 
like very nearly actually timeless in that you could play it at any point and somebody could tell you a year between 2010 and 2040 when this game came out and you'd be like, oh, that's a cool project that somebody did. Mm -hmm. Uh, It just has a sort of like it's it's a difficult to age look uh, that works really well for it. Um, All things considered, I think uh, a lot of my criticism of this game boils down to that I liked Inside better. Uh, I think Inside does more interesting things with its themes, and I think that the actual gameplay of it is better, but that's not really what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Limbo itself and what it sets out to do, I think it does incredibly well. Mm -hmm. Um, I really like this game. Uh, I think that it may push itself a little bit too far uh, in mixing up its mechanics and uh, trying to mash things that don't belong together together. Um, and that is probably it's, it's, if its biggest weakness is potentially over ambition, that's not the worst thing that could possibly be said. So, uh, I like the game. I do recommend it. Uh, and I do also recommend going out and playing limbo or playing inside as well. Uh, both their games are very good, pretty short, pretty easy to get a hold of. So, mm-hmm. This really paved the way for for inside. Mm-hmm. Thank you for listening to No Clip Pocket this week. What are we talking about next time? Next time, woo! That's ooh. my annual <laughs> high pitched ooh noise because we're getting into the Halloween season, boys and ghouls. <laughs> ghouls and ghosts. Ghouls and ghosts. We're gonna talk about ghouls and ghosts. No, we're not. Uh... <laughs> Next time, we're going to be talking about Buddy Simulator 1984. Which doesn't sound like a horror game. Or much of a game at all. It sounds like kind of a a mashup of words. (laughs) Uh, But I have played about half the game. And here's where I'm at. Mm -hmm. Normally we say, this is the kind of game it is. Uh Uh, I'm going to say, if you like a weird thing, check it out. Uh, because it does some weird stuff, and I still don't know if I'm at the point where the game is in its like final form. Mm. Uh, so we'll figure out what that's all about, and whether or not I like it next time. Until that time, you can get a hold of us. All of our contact information is on our website at noclippodcast.com. There you can find links to our Twitter account, our YouTube, where you can watch all of our old episodes. Uh, including our episode on Inside, in fact. Um, Or 2D platformers. What have we talked about? Hollow Knight. Yeah, that's one. Uh, Um, I feel like there are better examples there. Yeah, Celeste. Yeah. We don't do a lot of 2D platformers. That's a shame. For me. Yeah. Uh... And also, I mentioned uh, Donut County and Monument Valley on that. Those are, like, earlier games in the pocket. Mm-hmm. Donut County is more recent, I guess. Uh, both of those are cool games. You should check those episodes out, especially if you've played the games before. Uh, get fucking snapped up in a bear trap trying to not push that like button. <laughs> yeah. If you don't push the subscribe button, then the tribe of children will spring a trap on you they'll subscribe to murdering you (laughs) magazine (laughs) all right and if this in the butt (laughs) this is a story all about how we took chad's gain and turned it right down down.